So in November, a huge investigative story hit the news, namely the Panama Papers, you may recall that. And they revealed how big companies like Apple or people with power and money use offshore, the offshore tax industry to evade taxation. That's why this talk is important, because Vavoida is here now from the Open Knowledge Foundation, who will explain to you everything you need to know about interna international <coughs> taxation and why this should concern you as hackers. Please give an applause to Vavoida. Thanks. Yeah, good morning Leipzig and thank you for having me here so early and I will try to make this talk, although the topic is like really uh, dry and boring, <laughs> as exciting as it can be for taxation. So I work for the Open Knowledge Foundation, I do normally open data policy and transparency stuff and uh, I will present today why taxation is a perfect two-word issue and it's a worldwide two-word issue and how it connects to internet. Uh, CCC and technology and also how we shape the society with it. So how we got here, I'm from Austria, I normally have two colleagues with me, uh, that's uh, Max Kasi and Daniela Blatsch from Vienna and uh, Harvard University and we're trying to change something in that area. And uh, the talk will have three parts, so it's like the status quo, uh, intro and fun examples, how you make uh, tax loops working for your company. Uh, then the second part is why is that, the policy and the history, and the third one is then uh, what you can do about it, politics and the future. So uh, I got into the topic reading about an article about ExxonMobil, which is the sixth largest company in the world uh, by market cap and revenue. Uh, and especially ExxonMobil Spain. So they had like 2009 uh, and 2008 uh, one employee earning 44k a year and making 9.9 .9 billion net profits in these two years. So to understand this, that's like a factor of 112,000 uh, from his income to the profit for the company. And I was like, well, that's basically like uh, this John Doe from Spain is the stuck off of capitalism. There's nobody else probably in the world who is outperforming this guy for two years. And that's basically just done through like uh, making use of uh, tax holes. So the takeaway is like some corporations pay not so much corporate taxes and it's a lot of dough. In Germany we say it's a Batzengeld and at the end of the day if you have a billion here, a billion there, pretty soon you're talking about real money. And other people say there are only two things for certain in life, that's death and taxes. Uh, we would like to add that's like a third uh, certain in life and that's inequality. And while some discussing about reducing the taxes, we also want to talk about like reducing the inequality and this will be the talk about. And where everybody can agree on it, it's like the tax rates are too damn high. But you should also consider that taxes are always helping uh, funding public goods like schools, transportation, and so on. So in German, you have like Steuer, Steuern, or Steuern. It's like what kind of society you want to have and uh, how to contribute it versus to pay for it, in which direction we are moving. If you see that, it's like basically you get tax being input and you want to achieve uh, social goals or like stimulate economic growth with them. So the formula basically is if you have a tax revenue at the top, if CT, for example, the company pays less taxes, then somebody else has to pay more taxes or you have less tax uh, revenue to fund those public goods. And uh, this talk will mainly about like the legal optimization. There's a lot of illegal stuff going on, like in Germany, like the Comex uh, tax evasion, uh, which is Steuerhinterziehung or Betrug, which adds up to 12 billion. Or you have then like the regular Swiss tax fund in Germany, like uh, in NRV, it's was like 1.9, uh, 1.8 uh, billion. Where also like says Swiss spy got caught finding the leak for uh, in Germany. And uh, there's the famous quote from Barack Obama from 2016, where he said, uh, "But all of this is legal, but that's exactly the problem." So we basically say legal, illegal, scheißegal. We're living in a time where we need to discuss about that because we have uh, basically, as Andres and Horst had said, uh, software is eating the world. So either AI, robots uh, may eat the jobs or not. And we're in a round of discussion, should we have like a universal basic income or outcome? And uh, this is the trend uh, which is unique. So you have like the last decades, like basically two download slopes. Uh, that's like... Uh, the trend of corporate income tax as share of GDP, and that's like the uh, tax rate by itself. 
and that's like uh, causing some issues. So the corporate tax rules basic rule is that the less profit, the less taxes you pay, and you try to pay the taxes where the tax rate is lower. So when you're thinking about that, and since we're here, you can always thinking about like hacking the tax code, and uh, you have like your hackers working 24/7 for the four big uh, accounting firms, which would be Pricewaterhouse Cooper, Ernest and Young, KPMG, and Deloitte. And not only like they are hacking actively, some of them are also making like the smart move and are writing backdoors. That means like they are like involved in the process of writing the tax code, the law, uh, where they later will exploit it. So there's a lot of cyber going on, a lot of dough for the US. That means like there's two trillion uh, US dollars overseas, uh, and annually there's like around 60 billion adding on top of it. For the European Union, we are talking about some around. Uh, 50 to 70 billion a year, like where I come from, that's like a sixth of the schnitzel of Austria, or that's like uh, another button is like 10 uh, Berlin airports. <laughs> and the OECD uh, calls it in a base erosion price shifting report, it reaches. There's other reports like from taxjustice.net saying that's up to like 500 billion annually. And why this is happening? That's basically part of it uh, increased in the last decades because we're moving from an economy really based on real goods to intangible goods. And that means like uh, patents, uh, trademarks, uh, and so on. And you can see that really nicely in how uh, the mark top five market cap changed from uh, 2006 to 2017. So you had like 2006, you had like Exxon, Mobile, General Electric, Microsoft, British Petrol, and Citigroup, which means banking, energy, and industry. And then 11 years later, you have like basically like five tech companies. And those tech companies, the valuable stuff they're doing, like software code and so on, can easily like jump from one server to the other compared like if you have like a BP, like an oil refinery. So that's like makes it way easier to move something around if it's just digital. And uh, the most famous tech loophole was the double Irish dot sandwich. And that's basically what you need for that. You always need like two Irish companies. Uh, then you need a Dutch company. Then you need like a company somewhere in the Mermudas or what you call like an offshore financial center. And you transfer them the money around. So there's like the Chinese version because it doesn't matter much. It's just about the flag. So you start like somewhere in the US. Then you have like some offshore company who holds like the patents or the intellectual property stuff which gives it to one Irish company, and basically you go then to another Irish company who has here like uh, sales to the customers. So the customers are paying in here, then they pay like some money to the Netherlands company, then they pay the money to uh, the Irish company, then the Irish company pays it to the Bermuda company. Same stuff you have here, like a little bit more detailed, and it's the same stuff like going around here. So it's always basically two Irish companies, one Dutch company, some company in a uh, tax haven. And in that process, what is happening it really reduced the corporate tax rate to almost like a nothing. And that's basically a trend among the big companies. Pretty much everyone does it. So it's Microsoft, Apple, Google, Facebook, Amazon, Starbucks, also the German company SAB or uh, Inditex, which is the Spanish closing company. And uh, I want to point out one example. It's Google. So basically, Google has a worldwide revenue in 2014 of 46 billion. And uh, when you take it down to the UK, it's like a tenth of it, it's 4.6 billion. And on this profit of 10 billion uh, annually worldwide, uh, they paid somewhere around 2.3 billion. But in the UK, they only paid like 30 million. And that's because they're using like this Dutch Isle sandwich to pay less profits on the revenue in the UK. And then when you take a look like where Google got famous in Europe uh, lately, which is the Digital News Initiative, that's like 150 million they're using to spend on news organization. That's what it basically can call them like peanuts because that's basically less uh, than what they save in one year just on the tax uh, paying in uh, the UK alone. Same goes with Apple. So Apple is sitting right now on a cash of pile of 250 billion, and it's partly due uh, because the same system, or they had like a tax rate of just 0.5, uh, 0.005% uh, 2014. To put that in relation, it's like two-thirds of a schnitzel, the GDP of Austria of like 8 million people, or two-thirds of the depth of Greece, or twice the GDP from Berlin, or 50 airports. And so uh, 
the European Commission uh, wanted to force uh, Ireland to tax uh, Apple higher, but of course they refused it because that's partly their business model, uh, taking less uh, corporate taxes. And uh, the tap was last year 18 billion, and by December 17th, Ireland was forced to collect 13 billion from Apple because it's like about uh, competition. We will see how that ends up. I hope uh, somebody collects that. And uh, 2014, Ireland uh, was scraping their infamous double Irish tax uh, sandwich loophole, and everybody was like, woohoo, finally. But then uh, they also replaced it at the same time called something like patent box or knowledge development box. So it's a similar stuff, a different name, and a little bit less dodgy, but it will keep like uh, tech companies and pharmaceutical companies uh, ongoing doing their tax scheme. Another great example is uh, an investment opportunity from uh, Switzerland, Hungary, and uh, the Netherlands. So that was General Electric uh, on the 21st of December 2015 at 12 o'clock. Uh, the Dutch sold the General Electric Swiss to uh, Hungary for like uh, 40,000 francs. An hour later, they sold it again in different direction for 6.4. Billion. So that's like 60 minutes, a factor of 167,500. In order to understand that, that's like you upgrade your old modem to a 6 gigabit uh, line, or you upgrade your floppy disk to a 230 gigabit hard drive. Or you work only 1.5 hours in your whole life. And that's why it happened. It's basically they were selling some uh, rights for 8 billion. And uh, with the tax difference from Hungary to Switzerland, in, instead of paying 18% taxes, they only paid 2% uh, taxes, saving 1.4 uh, billion Swiss francs in one hour. And there are many more examples like that, uh, especially from Luxembourg. Um, Madeira is like a European island tax haven. IKEA has a hilarious uh, tax example, but I don't want to bore you. And I want to go quickly through what happened on the reporting side. So 2013, there was offshore leaks, which was the first uh, big uh, reporting addressing that issue. Uh, then a year later, you had like uh, Lux leaks addressing Luxembourg. Uh, interesting there was like it happened right after Juncker was like uh, getting the head of the European Commission. Uh, you can read it up uh, in the German Diplo cables. The slides are online and it's everything linked. And it was like about uh, 28,000 pages on like more than 500 ruling on companies how to get like special deals in Luxembourg. And then you have to understand why this is important. So every country in Europe basically is just trying to lower the corporate tax rate in order to attract the businesses. And he is now head of the European Union, which exactly should avoid that. In 2016, two years after the reporting, there was actually four times more uh, special deals in Luxembourg. Then we had the Panama Papers. Uh, that was a done or made available by a whistleblower. We don't know who it is, John Doe. Uh, the reporting started in uh, 2016, and it was mainly about uh, Mossack Fonseca, which like, was one of the service providers. It was the biggest leap uh, in data journalism, uh, 11 million um, documents and uh, 2.6 terabytes. And uh, one of the consequences, or not consequences, what happened afterward, that was like the 16th of October this year uh, in Malta, where uh, Daphne Kurana Galicia, uh, her car got bombed. And then uh, in November, the Paradise Paper came. Uh, same, like almost similar to uh, Panama Papers, different was in different uh, company. It was Apple Bee. And it was like a 19 tax US edition, and it was like high profile cases. So, this leaks in papers are uh, tremendous work, really amazing, and I think it helps a lot of moving the uh, discussion forward. I just want to remark it the system, the systematic uh, blaze behind it, were known before that. So, it's, uh, I would say it's like don't hate the player, hate the game, or hate the enablers. And the enablers are literally like those who are writing the law or like politicians. So to sum it up, uh, that's like a lot of dough, but some geld, and we're going to the second part, how did that happen? So uh, over the last uh, century, we had basically three deals uh, how to get taxes done. That was like source country based, arms length pricing, and bilateral treaties. So by source country based, it means like you tax where the production is happening. So if you have a car company in Germany, uh, it just happens there. 
arm's length pricing, when it's getting more complicated, you have a car company buying parts from Austria, then it means like you have two uh, separate uh, units and you price them where they are. So what you need there, and that's important, is like you have to find out the price. And that finding out the price, paying for the Austrian company, if it's like a regular product, like a some car but it's easy because you have a market on there and you can't make up uh, the margins like 10 or 100 times more if you do it with digital stuff the question is like who knows how much is it, is the google algorithm worth so you can't price this because there's no market on it the same goes with trademarks uh, one famous case was like the nike swoosh so with real goods, if you have competitors you know what the pricing will be with tangible goods it's difficult to figure it out so they're treating the national subsidies as independent companies and making market prices for this. So and then, then we're moving, why these are the problems? So basically, on the source country-based corporations can move their production from A to B. Let's say you have a car company, you can produce in Poland uh, cheaper than in Germany, then you move the production over there. So arm's length pricing, you can make up the prices and shifting profits around. That's basically the case, what happened uh, with uh, Google and the Bermudas. So out of nowhere, Google headquarter for like algorithmic stuff is in the Bermudas. And then the third uh, is uh, bilateral treaties. And on bilateral treaties, you pay a bunch of lawyers really good money to figure it out how to exploit the different uh, tax treaties. That would be the case with the double, Dutch, uh, double Irish Dutch sandwich. And so we have then two scenarios, which adds up to a third, making prices to shift profits we are accounting, move the actual production. And now that the kicks in, the really big part is like, it leads to tax competition between countries because you want to attract those companies. And that's basically leads to this graph where you see like from the 90s to 2016, we have uh, different countries, Germany, Ireland, France, the lowering the corporate tax rate. So Germany started out with 60, ending up with 30 here. Uh, Ireland was once up at 50 and is now at 12%. So that's the business model, attracting uh, US companies and uh, getting less corporate taxes compared to uh, their European neighbors. Same goes with uh, the US, it used to be stable a long time. There's also like the difference between a statutory corporate tax rate and the effective. The effective is lower, that's basically what you really pay. And uh, since we got a new president in the US, uh, you can see like this is the historic chart from 1980 till like a century. It used to go up before and uh, after the uh, Second World War, then it was stable a long time, and uh, in December it was announced that it will go from 35 down to 22. So you have like then an international competition for tax rate. So the question is like, what can be done about that? And one of the proposals, among others, is like you uh, put something in like a sales-based apportionment tax. That means like you require from uh, the multinational companies that they report the global profit and uh, sales and taxing in, in the country. You multiply the global profits and uh, by the share of the global sales happening in that country which want to tax, and then you tax the percentage of this number. The question is, how how can we get there or what we can do about that? Well, one thing is you can always pray about and pray that uh, praying will help changing tax structures or you can laugh about it when you remember like uh, ExxonMobil, uh, Starbucks, Ikea. The picture came from regular economics because that's part of the problem because they told us it will trickle down. And what means trickle down is like one of the most important things in my opinion is like you're realizing what trickle, trickling down means. And that's basically when you take a look at this chart, so like in the 1980, it started like you see like the uh, change in share of income. So you have like the top 1%, a gain of like 120%, then you have like the top 20% raising a little bit like above 25%, and everybody else is losing out. That means that. And uh, the other chart for that is like you have uh, from 45 to uh, uh, 0 05, uh, the productivity gains. And it used to align like pretty much up like uh, with real wages. So everybody got their fair share of that. But somewhere here, it's split it away. So you have like productivity gains, but the real wages are stagnant. So you should ask yourself, what happened to this pie? Where did it go? And so this also leads them to create two uh, classes, like those working for this company, taking the share out of it, which is not always the case if you take a look at, for example, workers leaving the Google Plex. They also have like two different uh, working classes and those who are not. 
And remember, this like adds up to almost like 100 euro per each year, European citizen each year on the conservative estimate. And that brings back like everybody is complaining about like the the governments don't have money anymore. But if you add that up, you get like for the since the financial crisis roughly around five percent. So you would have in instead of 90 percent uh, debt GDP ratio, uh, only 85 percent. So when you go to uh, offshore wells, uh, there are estimates from uh, Zuckman, which I only can recommend. He's like a student of Piketty, uh, who made that calculation based on the Panama Papers, that on average you have like 10% of the GDP hiding in the tax havens. Uh, Germany, for example, is like right here, with around, uh, I think it was summer 15, you have... Uh, Spain with somewhere around 10, and then you have Greece, which is striking out at 35 or something like that. And why this is important? Because normally the discussion right now is like about some tax havens sitting somewhere on some islands. But as you can see here, we're talking about Switzerland, Hong Kong, USA, Singapore. On the sixth place, you have, uh, or on the fifth place, you have, sixth place, you have done Luxembourg, and on eight, you have Germany. So the framing of the, the, the only effects like uh, this uh, tax havens on some small island, I would say it's not completely uh, correct. Uh, here you can see the difference score. So Panama on this chart uh, from uh, tax, ch tax justice network only comes in at number 13. And you have like Switzerland, Hong Kong. So this is basically the problem you have to attack. It's not so much about like uh, this completely dark money laundering, uh, illegal money. Uh, it's like a lot of stuff happens like right in your face, uh, known to everybody for decades. So although the leaks were amazing, it was nothing new. And you have like other cases like in Germany, like Comex, uh, which are around like for more than 15 years and nothing is changing. And that's the sharing of the tax havens uh, given... Uh, started out with Switzerland, which used to be number one now, Asian tax havens coming up, but the issue is like you have still like above 30 or around 30 percent uh, European tax havens. And why this is important? Because some countries try to do something about it, and when they do something, there's this case with uh, the Ukraine, where the people in Ukraine trying to find out where their money went, they got stuck in Germany, because we couldn't provide them the information because you don't have like beneficial ownership in Germany. Uh, there's an initiative called Open Ownership trying to solve that. And that's like once you have a weakest link where you block information, know who is uh, the owner of the company, uh, you can't get any further. So this one has to be addressed. And positive note is Tutsich. Atlas, Abyssal, so there's like some progress going on on December the 70th. There's a new anti-money laundering directive from the European Commission. That was the first step uh, after the Panama Papers. Uh, basically, it means that all those company registers in Europe has to be within the next uh, 18 months uh, figuring, uh, making uh, entry in a registry which is available to the public. That's good in one way. Again, it's not addressing like those companies like Apple because it's like legal. Uh, another step would be like uh, the European uh, Parliament elections 2019. And you have to remember, this is a political question. So years ago, when we had like the Eurozone crisis, uh, Mario Draghi, Super Mario, the head of the ECB, uh, stepped up and basically said, uh, whatever it takes, we will fix it. And I think for taxation, that needs to be done as well. And basically, we need structural reforms <laughs> that we avoid like having a situation like this again, that uh, I'm OK, I'm landed on the taxpayer. And, uh, and one part of that, it's like a framing issue. Uh, you should see it like paying the taxes when they are spent well as a positive thing. And uh, in the United States, there was a long discussion about if you call a, a tax death tax or a state tax. Uh, the conservatives label it a death tax because then you frame it better, uh, badly and uh, on a person who is dying. And the opposite way would be like uh, it's a state tax because the person is gone, some is left over and uh, it's about contribution to the society. Another thing is like this whole shit is like really boring and I'm really <laughs> sometimes think it's part of it like it's boring and complicated to keep you falling asleep. So you should get familiar with certain things like too big to jail when it comes to uh, 
justice, uh, I will be gone, you will be gone, like how incentives are split up in banking sector and uh, one of uh, the stuff I always recommend is The Big Short, it's like a movie about the financial crisis which I think is brilliantly done and explains the things which normally sounds like really complicated, completely easy. And you should have a Europe or a world which exists in the practice of tax solidity and not at the purpose of tax optimization itself. And uh, when you remember the opening keynote uh, from C. Strauss, uh, he called like old, slow AIs uh, corporations. And I think it would be easier to regulate those corporations on a tax level uh, compared to a tech level, because the framing and the time uh, is not that uh, crucial. Uh, which led me to the one quote, uh, when you have corporations or people, why don't we have a corporate death penalty for companies? And that was the case with Smile, and that was the Equihex uh, data leak and insider trading uh, this fall. So we have a certain responsibility to be there successful because uh, there's no alternative. And I uh, just want to say, remember, this isn't rocket science. It used to be there and see like as net neutrality. We need a level uh, playing field and for global corporations to like local uh, companies or uh, mini shops because they pay, basically pay nothing. And so you divide up the problem. And while you have net neutrality, it's the speed or what you can transport. Here it's the, just like the idea of um, easier money flow. And so i um, come to the end. And that's like the idea is like solar punk taxation. Solar punk is like something... How does a sustainable civilization look like and how can we get there? And I think taxation is probably one thing we will be stuck in the near future. So we think it should think about it to have like these two scales lined up. So we end up in a nice sustainable civilization. So the takeaway is like things changing because of intangible goods and technology. Three ways are companies pay less taxes. Uh, somebody probably has to pay up, um, take up the bill. Uh, it's more than 0.5% uh, of the European GDP. And that was me. Uh, remember the logo and uh, tighten the tax screws firmly. That was it. Thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the slides are online, uh, and if you have any questions after or next to the Q&A, uh, you just contact me at, uh, at Favoida or Walter at Sing.net. We have time for uh, very few questions. If you have one and want to be lucky to be one of those, please line up at the microphones. But please, Signal Angel, are there any questions from the internet? Yes, they are. Go ahead. How will universe, universal basic income deal with too big to fail? As in, how will we deal with a company who does bad, yet we are so dependent on their contribution to universal basic income that we can't punish them in any meaningful way? Can you maybe rephrase the question? How do you see the universal basic income in connection with the too big to fail phenomena? Well, I think the too big to fail uh, phenomenon is uh, one thing you normally, at a certain level, you should split up company. That it was done to the Delcos uh, years ago, to oil companies years ago. And when you, once you come to the situation that you have too big to fail, then you basically, uh, in game theory, they have a leverage. Uh, we have seen that in banks, you couldn't let them uh, go down because if they would have go down, that would be a systematic risk and you couldn't bear that risk. Uh, that would be my answer to that, independently from my uh, universal basic income. We go, may, we, since we started a little bit later, we go until five past, so we have time for, I see how the questions fit in. Microphone number two, please. Uh, hello, I have two questions. Um, <clears throat> there is now alternative uh, to Bitcoin called Zcash and Monero. And the advantage of those two cryptocurrencies is that it's basically untraceable compared to Bitcoin. So my question is, in the future, if many more companies are going to adapt, uh, adopt this uh, untraceable cryptocurrency and start paying, for example, the employees with it, how, how are you going to manage to tax those uh, people or uh, corporations? And the second question is, a more reflection on the state of the European Union. The EU was created uh, and has opened the borders uh, in 1992. 
And I'm part of a region from uh, south of Belgium where everybody goes to Luxembourg mm -hmm. to um, fetch their uh, gas because it's cheaper. And it's still the case because we do have different member states that have very dif uh, um, different fiscal laws that, and uh, at the EU level there's no uh, legislation um, as in the US there's no legislation to harmonize those fiscal uh, uh, laws um, and it's actually uh, a unanimity I'm, I'm sorry, topic. What, yeah. is, what is your question? You asked one question and maybe you yes. answered that. So we don't have a lot of time. So in, the, in the US there's no fiscal, there's fiscal competition between the states, the same is in Europe and I don't see with unanimity in the Council of Ministers that it's going to change in the near future. The, what you mentioned earlier, Luxembourg, Malta, uh, uh, Holland apparently blocked this uh, uh, 17 December initiative. So I don't see with unanimity, like at some point, one country like Luxembourg say, fuck off, and then we can't make any progress. So the first question with cryptocurrencies, uh, I think uh, <laughs> the leverage on the state, like so basically if company A and that company decides to go to Zcash and making uh, their uh, transactions anonymously, good luck with that because then basically uh, the tax system strikes back. Uh, I don't think there's like, unless you want to go completely underground, there's no chance that you can avoid that. Maybe they have a f certain advantages from the speed when they implement it, but you will not be able to uh, provide the books you need for a tax audit, and then they get you on something else. If they want to get you, they always get you, even if uh, everything else is fine. And the second one, yes, the European has a competition. The question is how far you want to let the competition go. And uh, that's the same thing with Juncker. I mean, Juncker did a phenomenal job for Luxembourg when he was uh, their finance minister and uh, uh, premier minister, but uh, it hurt like other countries. So at the end of the day, what you do in politics, you have to find a solution together how you deal with it. Uh, the first step is that uh, Ireland has to basically being forced to take the money from Apple because it's like uh, not fair competition to everybody else. I mean, and that's a question the society has to ask you. You can go down to zero corporate tax if you say that you don't need it. There are some people arguing for that. And at the end of the day, somebody has to pay the bill or you basically say you privatize everything and you don't want to have a government. That's like a, on the one side. If there may be a middle ground, you have to find a solution how you make your revenue. And uh, this is one part where you clearly see a trend that the revenue from that area goes down and maybe has some implications. I mean, we're living in Europe, which is halfway falling apart, and partly because of that reason, because uh, we have an erosion of uh, the tax base, and uh, at the end of the day, other people getting blamed for that, which they didn't cause. So, as I said, it's a political question. We, I'm sorry, we, are up, we ran up with our time. Microphone one. You can reach for Voida by Twitter or by email well, if you have further questions. I will be around here after the talk. I'm sorry? I will be around here if you... Yeah, so you can go directly to him and ask him. Thank you for coming here for this talk. And please give a warm round of applause to Voida. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>